Hey everybody, I'm really excited about today's episode. I talked with my longtime friend, Greg Garner, and we had a really great conversation about building up others and helping people to see and walk into their own potential and growth. Greg shared about his doctoral work, which is at the intersection of education, psychology, and design, and his role as a learning and performance specialist at a pharmaceutical research company. I always enjoy learning from Greg, and this conversation was no exception, and I can't wait for you all to learn too. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Greg Gardner. All right, welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast. Today, I'm joined by my friend Greg Gardner, and I'm so excited. We're going to talk all things learning design and leading teams. We're going to talk about doctoral research, and um, Greg is an amazing friend and thinker, and I always leave conversations with him um, thinking about new things. He pushes my thinking. Uh, He is also an amazing uh, includer, Greg. You just always bring people together, include people, connect them, and so thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the podcast today. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, any literally anything that Tracy Clark asked me to do, I will say yes. Um, so the whole like, you know, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? I don't know. If Tracy asked me to do it, there's probably a good reason. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So uh, I know not in our, our notes um, leading up to this, but I'll call out that, um, you know, in the strengths finder, one of my top five strengths is uh, what's known as stretch the circle wider, and that is it is inclusion. Um, that is something that I not only proactively do, but I, I actually am uh, gifted at it. Um, and so I don't have any qualms about bragging on myself for my ability to bring people together. That's something I really enjoy doing. Yes, and it has been over, you know, we have probably known each other since, I don't know, what, 2013, 2014? 14 that time period maybe 2012 yes, there. and mm-hmm. you have stretched the circle wider for sure in in and some of the connections that you help to bring are people that i still think of as dear friends those people you can just pick up where you left off with even as life and you know geography has taken us to different places there's still some of my dearest friends and and colleagues across the country and now really world as people have gone on to different places so thank you so much for that Greg, at the beginning of our podcast, we like to ask this question, if you'll tell us kind of your story and and what you build. And I know you have qualms even about this question, which I anticipated. So tell us a little bit of your story, kind of introduce yourself. Um, This helps me secretly not get anything wrong in people's introduction. That's why I asked this question. (laughs) So you can introduce yourself and share a little bit about what you build. So I... I went to college thinking that I was going to work for NASA and that I was going to design spacecraft. Um, since the time I was two years old, that's all I really wanted to, wanted to do was either be an astronaut or, or build spacecraft. I got exactly one semester into my engineering program and I realized that this was not for me and that there are, there's a difference between people who think that the end product of, of engineering work is really cool that's me and then there are people that really like doing the work of engineering and that was not me and so i uh, my first career crisis was when i was 18 years old and couldn't figure out what i was going to do with myself and so i just decided to get a business degree and then i'd figure it out from there Uh, i graduated uh, right as the uh, recession was starting to ramp up a little bit those of you may recall um, back in 2007 when i graduated and then into 2008 was not a great time to not have any work experience and only have a business degree. So that was a lot of fun. I ended up in education and went from being a classroom teacher at the middle school level to an instructional coach uh, starting out at the middle school level. That's uh, how I met Tracy. I got plugged in at the kind of the education technology side of things and working um, to help folks figure out how to use technology in instructional ways. that journey took me to North Carolina, where I am now. I, I live in Durham, North Carolina, and um, worked at a middle school in this area, and then uh, was asked to join uh, a team out of NC State University's College of Education, doing essentially instructional coaching across the state of North Carolina. And then I got an interesting offer about four years ago um, to join a pharmaceutical research company. And so that's actually where I am now, is I'm a learning and performance specialist at a contract research organization and we uh, support 
uh, pharmaceutical research uh, clinical trials. And so some of the things that I can talk about in that <laughs> field, as you can imagine, it's pretty secretive. But some of the things I can talk about is, you know, things that my company has helped with is uh, we help with COVID vaccines in uh, pediatric use. Mm -hmm. And so um, the fact that kids are able to safely get COVID vaccines was supported by my company. Um, some of the things we've we changed the face of, of how peanut allergy is studied um, and, and some of our work has, has changed how parents now know how to approach peanut allergy, um, both in prevention and in treatment um, is some of the work that we've done. And so uh, it was an a interesting opportunity to essentially ask the question of can instructional design, can someone who specializes in helping other people do their jobs better, uh, as I like to think of it at least, does that have a role in pharmaceutical research? And so in terms of what I build, um, I struggle with the answer to that question. So it's not that I, I wouldn't say that I have qualms about it so much as I don't know that I build anything in terms of building a what. And so I think about who do I build? And in every arena that I just described, if I were to focus on the what, and you know, if I, oh, I need to build an excellent e-learning course, or oh, I need to build an excellent lesson plan, I think I'd miss out on some of the people that what they really want is to be better. Mm. And they want to be better at what they do. They want to be better learners. They want to be better um, you know, mothers. They want to be better husbands. Uh, whatever their situation may be. And in all of these situations, um, there are people that are looking for partners in that journey. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the best things that I can do is to, to come alongside someone and just walk with them and figure out, you know, how can I build you up? And if you want to be a better project manager in this pharmaceutical research world, how can I best support you developing your project management skills? And so anything that I've done um, along the way, it's really just been about how do I help people. Mm -hmm. And honestly, even, you know, Tracy, you mentioned my, my doctoral work. So even just as a PhD student, what I'm trying to do is bridge the gap between designers and practitioners, right? I just described my background as being in education. But I'm in, I'm, my PhD work is through the College of Design mm -hmm. at NC State. And so the other people that are in my program have backgrounds like graphic design and architecture. And they're looking at me going, what the heck is a teacher doing in our PhD program? And that's a legit question. And so I'm trying to stand in the gap between people who, who think that certain things don't belong together. And I just want to figure out how do we bring these people together? Mm. And so back to that includer role, like I'm trying to, you know, my, my dissertation is going to be bringing together the fields of psychology, education, and design, and a little bit of technology thrown in, and how do we bring that all together uh, to uh, build something great, build an experience, build a process, build a model that, that helps more people. And I just think everyone has so much to offer, and mm -hmm. so really what I'm doing is I just want to build a way for them to see it. I, I hear in that... Um a piece that that of course yes is this includer expanding the circle i also hear and have had the privilege to see the empathy that you bring and it's like this piece of helping others see in themselves what they can't see you're so observant and thoughtful and rooted in that research able to just articulate for people you know things in a way that i think help people let their guard down and let you into spaces that a coach or a leader in other roles may not be able to get in, if that makes sense. So maybe, maybe tell us a little bit more about leading others. Tell us about your initial desire to lead others and how that has been meaningful for you. Maybe what you've learned there. What do people get wrong in leading others? Anything around that that resonates with you? The one thing that I've really wanted for my career is to be able to lead a team of people because I, I think that fundamentally most of the folks that, are, that end up in leadership positions didn't really want to be there. They were experts in some other domain, some other field. You know, they're experts in statistical analysis, for example. And 
you know, the traditional career ladders say, and even in teaching, that, you know, as soon as you're excellent enough at whatever your particular domain is, that we're going to promote you uh, as though this is some big reward into something that you don't really want to do. And so, right, like career paths for teachers are traditionally like, hey, be really excellent at interacting with kids and helping kids to grasp something difficult so that we can promote you to being a principal where you're a little more removed from those kids. And then if you figure out how to be really excellent as a principal, we're going to move you to central office where you're even further removed from kids. And so, like, why is it that, and this happens in business too, that you know, I mentioned statistical analysis, right? You can be really excellent at statistical analysis, so then we're gonna put you in a role where you supervise other um, analysts, but you yourself are doing less analysis. And then if you are really good at that, maybe you get moved into more of a departmental leadership program, and so now you're supervising other departments that you've never worked in mm. and don't really want to. And this happens over and over and over, and I, I kind of have the reverse problem that I don't feel like I really am good at anything in particular, but I'm pretty good at like working with others to figure out what it is that they want to do. And so for me, like being a leader is kind of exciting because it feels like I have something to add. I have something to offer. I can, I can help others figure out what it is that they want to do. And then how are we going to move them towards that? Yeah. I'm going to have to push back on the um, not, not being that good at many things because that is simply not true. Uh, you're good at everything that you have set out to do, at least from my perspective of what I've seen, um, and are thoughtful at all of those things. So apologies for interrupting, but I couldn't let that one go. So Greg, I originally in my worksheet, there's a podcast worksheet because I'm nerdy on the backside, y'all. Um, originally, I did not have an Enneagram question in my worksheet. And my friend who came on an episode said, why is there not an Enneagram question? You love the Enneagram. And I was like, ah, no, you know, but every single conversation it has come up. So I'm just going to embrace it at this point. Tell us your thoughts on the Enneagram, where you see yourself, anything around that. I feel like there's a question behind this question and, or maybe it's an accusation behind the question that I'm somehow secretly against the Enneagram. And so we'll put that to bed. I'm not. Um, but I took two different Enneagram tests a couple years back, uh, a small group of people that I'm, uh, we were meeting together regularly. We decided like we would go through this and talk about how the Enneagram um, can be you know, kind of used in our daily lives and how we can you know, better interact with one another and that kind of a thing. And so part of that was I took an Enneagram test and it said that I was, uh, I think it said I was a three. And I read through the three, and I was like, that's ridiculous. That, that's not accurate. Um, and so I was like, I found somewhere else that had an Enneagram test, and it said it was a seven. And I read through that, and I was like, that's, no, I'm not that either. Like, I've just, and those are very different Enneagram numbers. Like, how in the world? So anyways, I decided uh, to take it upon myself to just read through all of the Enneagram numbers and, and kind of read through like how with this very just kind of open openness to you know maybe not knowing at all where I'm gonna gonna land and in doing that and, and really kind of familiarizing myself with kind of the full Enneagram matrix if you will um, I just picked five um, it just sounded the most like me and so there's I, I can't I've taken a couple of other tests since then and, and now even knowing that I think I'm a five and you know I'm I'm one of those that I can kind of see what the question is really asking and I can manipulate my answers to try to get the the final result that I want and even knowing that I still can't get a test to tell me that I'm a five and um, I have some another friend of mine who he he took the test he's a five he is for sure a five. Um, and he and I are very similar. And so afterwards, he was like, yeah, dude, you're basically exhibiting five behavior That's what I was gonna say. in what you're trying to That's do to figure say. out what you are from an Enneagram perspective. So anyways, the short version of that is to say that, like, the best way I can describe it is, like, and it, those of us that would claim the number five, uh, we, we look at everything. And we are constantly taking in new information and we are constantly evaluating and assessing and trying to just piece things together and figure out what makes sense. And then once we land on something, we are 
junkyard dogs about it. Like that is the thing. Like we and we know because we just spent all that time and energy evaluating and assessing everything, and it's going to take a lot of new information to convince us otherwise. And so um, I'm pretty solid at this point that like I'm I'm probably an Enneagram five, um, but at the same time, you know, I I can't find a test to tell me that. Well, I believe that one of the things about the Enneagram 5 is that they do not like to be told that they are any one thing because they like their uniqueness. So that's what makes the most sense to me here about it all is that don't tell me I'm one number, you know, right? I'm these other. (laughs) For me, the Enneagram was just really helpful in giving language and um, to things that I would or even like mental thought patterns like it did a lot of good for me there. One of the ideas behind the Building Thinkers podcast is that in all of our different industries and all of our different work worlds and all that we over we tend to overcomplicate things and so there's there's profound insight in simplicity the collins quote and then you know many others have said similar things but what is it in your industry in your work or just any of the lessons learned that you think we overcomplicate another potential sentence stem is if only people knew it's kind of as simple as this. So again, now that we're we're primed through the lens of Enneagram Five and this idea of that, like I'm constantly just seeing everything as as valuable and, and useful, it means that you know trying to distill down and saying here's the one thing that people need to know um, generally is what leads me to kind of reject the premise of a question and say like well. The, maybe the one thing that you need to know is that there's not one thing that you need to know. Oh, great. Um, I'll take that. So, sure. <laughs> so, but I guess where I, where I tend to land here is th- around um, conversations of like productivity mm-hmm. and that there was a period in time, maybe in my second or third year as a teacher, where I started really exploring what kind of the business world had to say about personal productivity and and business productivity and how to improve output and you know and again as a classroom teacher I'm trying to translate this into how to help my students be successful and so I'm, I'm applying it to myself and applying it to my students and then I started kind of giving presentations at conferences and people were, were inviting me to speak about productivity and particularly generational differences around productivity and output and what that has now led me to at this kind of point in the game is this idea that, you know, I, I really think that it, I wish people knew that productivity is not some sort of personal problem that needs to be resolved. Um, that you are a human being and, you know, if you want to extend that to the, the kind of catchphrase of you're a human being, not a human doing, that's fine. Um, where I kind of tend to land on that though is think about what it is that you can accomplish and be proud of your work and it measuring things in terms of quantity is fine in this sort of Tayloristic factory model of productivity and output and you know people come back from vacation and they talk about I have 650 emails as though that's some sort of badge of honor And, you know, I get that, you know, we're not in control of who comes into our inbox, but we are in control of how we respond to those things. And that's where I land is I want to look at if I had 650 emails after coming back from vacation, I would want to look at how many of those can I just delete because they've already been handled. And that to me is the mark of someone who's being really successful in their career and someone who's being really successful in the way that they've structured their time and the way they've structured their work is you have systems in place to where you are not a single point of failure and i daily am trying to make myself redundant i want the people that i lead to be able to jump in and answer the questions that previously maybe i felt like i was the only one that could answer that question because if other people can handle the things that are being sent to me and I'm not the only one that, that has to respond, it means I am building others. Mm-hmm. And, and back to the first question of what do you build, I am trying to build others. And if they are able to step in and their productivity uh, is, is a reflection of my productivity and my productivity is a reflection of theirs. We have this sort of communal experience of being able to be effective in what we do. 
and it isn't about measuring who's doing the most and I'm I'm versus you know, me versus you and I'm up against this and trying to accomplish that thing. I think accomplishments are are best viewed in the rearview mirror and not as something that you're striving towards. It's great to have goals. You should. I have lots of them. I'm in a doctoral program. I clearly have one goal in particular that I'd really like to accomplish and my wife would prefer that I accomplish it very soon. But those are accomplishments that you have to show up every day and work towards. And you have to have people around you that support you, people around you that you are working with because nothing is truly done in isolation. And so, I mean, I don't know which one of those things needs to be the most important, but I just come back to like productivity is not about you. And if it is, maybe there's some other things that are going on. There's so many things to build on within there that you gave us lots of bullets there. Um, so I'm going to first tell back a little bit of what I heard in there. And one thing is in this leadership role, I hear you speaking to the value of helping others see in themselves the things that they want to adjust and move forward. So versus kind of a, you need to change this, like, you're coming in alongside, it kind of reminds me of the, the shift in teaching that sometimes we talk about as sage on the stage, guide to moving guide on the side. I kind of hear that same thing in this leadership role within your current organization to becoming not a leader that tells, but a leader that asks, how can I support you? And then you actually play that out. And it, so it's not even just in name, but in practice that you're supportive of others, which I think is pretty unique. You may not see that in yourself, but I think it's pretty unique that in a leadership role, you you truly are empowering others because I think sometimes when people say that, it's not always the practice that actually plays out. It's something nice to say, you know, in a meeting or whatnot. But then the other thing of the systems that you're supporting to put in place to allow you know, um, and I don't know the details of the exact work, nor do I need to, but um, it sounds like allow the people that are maybe closest to doing the things of the work to get those things done. So it's the empowering those that are in the field or on the front lines or whatever term you want to use to be able to do those things without having to over depend on their leader, AKU. Um, and that is powerful to make the workers exponential, right? That that if they have to constantly go back in this loop of I have to ask Greg, I have to ask Greg, then like nobody gets more things done. But I hear in the the application of the productivity work from your from your prior work or just a, a general desire. I have a similar desire to continue to learn productivity, but maybe for a different reason from the Enneagram three because I do want to master it. And so this idea that you just provided us of you know, not trying to fix the productivity problem at, because we are human. I find myself wrestling with intellectually understanding that I should be just the human being and not the human doer. But, but the Enneagram 3 literally believes that the kind of the core purpose is the doing. And so that's something I've mm -hmm. had to work on rewiring. And, and there was this piece it was this song about the different Enneagram numbers. And so the one for the three talked about this line where work and rest are equally revered, um, mm. was kind of this future vision of a three that's really attuned to the value of both. And I can intellectually understand that. Mm -hmm. I cannot seem to do that out in practice, <laughs> but you're just saying here, it's not a problem to be fixed, right? It's not a, if you don't get the things done necessarily, like it's not always this thing that maybe marketing tells us we should strive for, become better, 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 do more, do more, you know, all these things, output, output, efficiency, efficiency. But how, maybe the question there then is, okay, I get it, I'm supposed to be able to be but yet, what's the balance between we do want to be more efficient, we do want to get more done to make the impact we want to make. So can you unpack that part a little further for my own selfish reasons? Sure. So, 
Yeah. So the first thing that I, I want to do is you brought up the um, kind of the education um, aphorism of you know from moving from a sage on the stage where someone is standing at the front of the room and just you know bloviating their expertise and everybody else is supposed to just you know learn from them. Um, and of course, we know that's not a very effective means of learning. And moving to this guide on the side kind of model where you're working alongside someone and you're kind of pointing them in the right direction and nudging them along. And one of the things that I, I wish I could give appropriate credit here, I don't know who said this first, it was not me. Um, but the, the next step of that is meddler in the middle. And that's truly a lot more fun um, because that is where um, you are working not just alongside someone where you are, the, the model of guide on the side still retains power within the leader, right? It still demonstrates or, or shows that the leader is exercising some sort of authority or power. And by virtue of being a leader, your power is already implicit. You already have that level of power. You don't need to exercise it in such a way that you are still guiding and directing someone um, in, in a particular way, because what you're doing at that point is you're essentially just creating duplicates of yourself um, and not allowing that person to grow into themselves. And so someone who is moving more towards that kind of what I said as meddler in the middle, that is someone who is playing with a group and every person is allowed to be who they are. And so productivity and efficiency and getting things done is then about the journey and the team working together. It's about the people that you have in your life and the people with whom you may have positional authority and you may have positional leadership um, over them. And that, that is a form of power, but at the same time, you are recognizing the beauty and authenticity of each person that you are with. And if I could take one more metaphor here, um, my current boss, um, a, a metaphor that he introduced me to that I'm pretty sure is from restorative practices, but I'd have to double check it, um, is a lot of our conversations are treated like tennis, where one person hits it and then they expect one person to hit it back. And then that same person hits a, a, a new thought or a new question or a new, t new ask, a new to-do, and then one person hits it back. And the, instead of playing tennis, what if we played volleyball? where one person throws it out there and there are nine other people that had the opportunity to bounce that ball around and it may be a while before it comes back to you. And that's okay because again, it's about people bringing themselves to the work, bringing their unique set of skills and talents and experiences and creating something that you could not have created by yourself. Mm -hmm. You just couldn't have done it. And so when, when we think of of solopreneurs and we think of folks who are working by themselves um, it's easy for people to I think to kind of move towards well that's nice when you have a team or when you're in a big company or when you have a large organization whatever nobody is an island and this idea that someone who's a solopreneur doesn't interact with other people then you don't have a business you don't have work that you are doing that makes a difference. You are interacting with clients and customers. You are interacting with vendors. You are interacting with hopefully future team members. Uh, if your business is going to grow, you're going to have to hire. You're going to have to expand. You're going to have to bring other people along this journey with you. And so this idea that you're, you're not in a position to be able to invite others to play with you, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's, it's naive and short-sighted. Yeah. And all of us have people in our lives that are waiting to be invited to play. And they're waiting to be invited into that volleyball game. They want to play. They've been sitting on the sidelines. They've been told that they can't. They've been told that they need to wait their turn. They've been listening to the sage on the stage for too long and they're ready to, for, to, to put things into practice. And as a leader, it's your job to invite them. I love it. Greg, as I'm thinking about that idea and the way it sounds like you play that out with your team the question that came to mind is how different was that for your team like was there a learning curve for your team to understand but wait you don't want me to insert something that they were used to doing like was that what, what you just described in um, a, a beautiful model of 
inclusive leadership is the term that comes to mind. I don't know if that's the right term, but you know, in this um, collaborative, authentic model of work, is that something you brought in to create a culture for your team that that's unique to that, or is it a larger organizational direction, or something in between? <laughs> I don't think that that kind of work comes naturally um, to anyone. It doesn't even come naturally to me. I'm, I feel like I'm here trying to pretend I'm some sort of expert on it. It's a daily practice of keeping myself in check. It's a daily practice of looking at an email that comes in and saying, I am not going to respond to that. I know the answer, but me answering that email right now does not help this other person to grow and learn in their career. And so it has been weekly check-ins. It has been quarterly summits where our team comes together and kind of has a retreat. Um, it, has, it has been, you know, on, on a nearly daily basis, working with the people that I am responsible for leading to make sure that they feel safe and comfortable asking questions, that they are allowed to say, I don't know. It just takes time. It is, it is not something that you can implement overnight. I have been in a formal leadership position for less than one year. And so to pretend like I've got all the answers is ridiculous. And I hope I am not giving that, that impression. I am trying to journey with those with whom I have leadership over. Like I said, it's a practice. It is a habit that I'm trying to put on every day and there are days I totally get it wrong and I jump on top of somebody and I'm and it, it makes them feel bad and I have to have the humility to step back and say that was completely inappropriate I'm sorry and I I'm trying not to do that in the future and I need you to call me out on it if it happens again um, but that is that is not something that comes natural you know yeah love it and one of the things you were talking about earlier is this gap between research and application. So I'm wondering if there's anything else in that area you want to hit on. Maybe question one is, what have you seen that could help us move towards closing the gap? So for me, where where I'm doing most of my learning um, over the last few years um, in this particular arena is just understanding that not everybody sees the gaps. And that was difficult for me because I see them so clearly. And that's not anything special about me. And that's, that's just kind of how my brain works is I've always had very kind of transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary interests. Um, and, you know, I, maybe it's the Enneagram 5 thing. I don't know. But, like, everything is interesting to me. Almost everything is interesting to me. I'm going to draw the line at uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, the first movie. Like, that one was not interesting to me um but <laughs> oh then you there I don't are know, so my many four year old and eight year old really liked sonic the hedgehog so i don't know you're missing out we're fostering a 15 year old who really wanted to see sonic 2 and so my homework before we could go see sonic 2 was i had to see sonic 1 so that i would understand sonic 2 and afterwards he was like that's not as good of a movie as I remember. I'm like, yeah, it was not a not a great movie. <laughs> so anyways, the gaps that exist and the what I would view as some of the solutions to the gaps or the, seeing the ways that they might come together um, are just things that I tend to see clearly. It, it is something about me and the way that I view the world that I'm able to just start kind of pulling strings at things and saying, well, couldn't we use this over here? And what if we use this that way? Um, and it has been a road of learning for me to know that people don't always see it that way. And not only do people not necessarily see it that way, and that's that obviously the way I'm describing it implies that they should. Mm. Um, but people believe strongly that things should stay in silos. They, in, in certain arenas, people believe very strongly that you shouldn't co-mingle, intermingle these kinds of ideas in, in every scenario. Clean example of that is when I applied for the, this doctoral program that I'm in, um, apparently I split the faculty in half. And there was half of the faculty, because I was the first non-designer to apply for the doctoral program in the College of Design at NC State. And so, because I'm a not non-designer, whatever that means, um, half the faculty said he doesn't belong. He's he needs to go apply in education or psychology or whatever else, but he doesn't belong in design. 
and half the faculty said, what is design? Isn't design about solving problems? And here's a, a problem solver, fundamentally a problem solver from a different discipline who wants to use our body of knowledge and the things and the strategies that we use on a regular basis in order to solve problems in other fields. Why wouldn't we give him this chance? And so obviously you can tell which side I agree with. Um, and so the, the faculty ultimately decided that if my advisor wanted to stick his neck out and kind of run this risk as a kind of a pilot study, that he would be given enough latitude to do so. But to know that he was not going to really receive a lot of institutional support if I ran into other issues or other roadblocks, that I was basically going to be on my own as, as kind of an experiment of one. And I'm okay with that. Um, that's, that's kind of how I've always viewed things is, you know, you have to be willing to try new things. And that's where this idea of bridging the gap really kind of comes into, into practice is saying, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't necessarily know if it's even possible, like let alone if it's going to be successful and fruitful and lead to something great. It, it may just crash and burn completely, but we won't know until we try. And I've just always had this posture of what if and why not? And you know, what if we tried this thing and when someone says, oh, you can't do that, well, why not? What, what's the absolute worst case scenario? What is the worst thing that would happen as a result of trying these two things that pre nobody's really put together before? It doesn't work? Cool, then we're in the same place we are today. Like nothing's fundamentally changed if this pilot fails. Yeah. Let's try it. Let's see what happens, right? I was just thinking Greg was a really fun middle school student to have as a teacher, I'm sure. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I was really frustrating for the students who knew how to play the middle school game and like already kind of knew how academics worked because I don't follow the rules, <laughs> as you can imagine. And so they wanted to know like, what assignments by what dates and can I turn them in early and what extra credit is available and that's not how I ran my classroom so that's there was space for possibility for students who weren't otherwise quote-unquote good students I don't know why not and what if and, and yeah. I think if you can say those three things on a regular basis you're in a pretty good spot I hear a lot of challenging the status quo there's a lot of challenging the status quo and the areas i think that's also where a lot of creativity happens right when we're willing to look tangentially or even totally outside and say why couldn't these two things come together or maybe this space is further along at naming and creating systems around this thing that we call x over here and so i think that with the type of complex and dynamically changing problems we face as humans see that there are kind of two sides to this type of thought process but i i see one as you know vastly more needed at this moment in time that we need to be moving away from silos and into you know opening the circle of connection maybe it's in more of an r d space to protect whatever the things that people feel fearful about but i think more often the questions the, the reasons why people may want to stay siloed need to be questioned themselves. Why, why would you want psychology to not mm. be able to be applied into X, Y, and Z, you know? And, and because it doesn't take away from the pure psychology for it to be leveraged into somewhere else, which could be the only thing to try to like put myself in someone's shoes that would be afraid of that. What would they be afraid of? Well, it might be misapplied or misunderstood or how could an educator understand this or how could a designer understand this or non-designer understand this? And um, so in interesting, you know, kind of thought process. I bet that that has made the pursuit of a doctoral program rather challenging um, to be in. Well, I don't know that it's you know more or less challenging. I only have my own own experience to to speak from, but I can say that it's certainly non traditional, um, and that I, in the conversations I've had with other folks that go through doctoral programs, um, you know, I, there are a lot of conversations that I'm having that um, are are novel. The, the people haven't really had those conversations before, and you know, an easy example of that is. Um, I recently applied to a conference that's an 
architecture conference, and I'm trying to present on how to implement a new model for questioning assessment during a user research phase um, of a prototype experiment. And I, was, I ran this by a couple of folks who have architecture backgrounds now that I have access to that community. And the, the feedback is pretty universal of nobody has ever said these things to an architect. Like architects don't prototype. Architects don't do user research. Architects, you know, and so, you know, there's, there's so much of this that I just look at as possibility. It's just potential to me. And it's all opportunities to have really interesting conversations and ask those questions of what if and why not. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's it's an exciting adventure to to be able to explore and just poke and say like what's here and is there anything that's of value and even if there's not that's interesting to say well why not so I, I'm I'm excited about this adventure but I'm also um, as I alluded to I'm also kind of ready to be done I'm yeah. entering year six of this program and so I'm ready to write this dissertation and. Uh, you know, move on to something new and interesting. Well, we will be supportive and looking forward to the <laughs> opportunity to call you Dr. Garner in the future, which I will only refer to you as at that point. You won't be Greg anymore. Well, Greg there was another thought that that made me have, and it was just this idea, like my eyes got kind of wide with this idea that nobody had ever asked an architect that. Cause I, I don't know the whole premise of where you're at with that, but just from the explanation, that you provided there i'm like how in the world has no one asked an architect to prototype or this or that like to me just you yeah. know from design in the different areas that i've intersected so i think that the possibility there is incredible and sometimes i'm surprised by those moments too because i think kind of the oh well there's nothing new under the sun or the you know like everybody somebody's already done it before there's no book for me to write because everybody's already written or, or these lies like johnny cuff's really great at talking about a lot of those you're too old or you're too young there was this exact right moment for you mm -hmm. to do that thing right that facade so i hear that in this like there is room for you both in your program and in whatever the next thing is you want to do with that whether it's in your existing organization or whatever and there will always be room for you and the others that you include because of your willingness to challenge the status quo. And I think remarkable progress to be made in the things that you can, you've been able to both publicly share and the things that maybe nobody will know publicly, but the things I know you're working on that have great impact. So that's just my Tracy encouragement for you <laughs> there. I don't, it, it doesn't lead us that. to another question. It's just a moment of encouragement <laughs> I could um, pass up. Okay, Greg, we're gonna get to some of the fun stuff. Uh, tell us a couple book recommendations and if you have any other recommendations for any other type of input. Yeah, so uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the books are, are essentially my love language. And, um, you know, I basically will never say no to a, a good book. And my Goodreads list of things I want to read is, of course, um, growing all the time. And I will seemingly never make a dent in it. But some of the books that I've been able to read over the last few years um, have have some old, some new that have really made a difference for me. And so I, I just want to keep referencing them and encouraging other people to read them. Um, one of them is an older book um, that is called Lateral Thinking. I think it was written in the 70s. Um, and uh, uh, De Bono is the author. And it just asks a lot of the questions that I've kind of shared today and this idea of um, looking for ways to move laterally and that you know we constantly as a society we always think about how to move forward um, but if we have the ability to move laterally and take a parallel path and, and ask a question that maybe others haven't asked before it, it opens up new possibilities and so it's it's fundamentally a book about creativity uh, really and um, just phenomenally useful and, and um, valuable for me um, the other book uh, that I cannot possibly uh, pass up the ability to recommend that I know a lot of people have read, but it does not get enough airtime in my opinion, and that's Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Freyer. This guy is like my brother from another mother. Like he, um, had, he had been run out of countries by kind of the political establishment because his approach to life 
was how do we take people who otherwise don't have opportunities presented to them and acknowledge and recognize the inherent power and, and knowledge and wisdom that they all that they have, not because someone gave it to them, but because they already had it. And that is pretty challenging if you are the establishment, if you're the authority. And so Friar's um, models and, and opinions on how to recognize the beauty in, in everyone that you meet. I, like I said, I just I can't fathom giving book recommendations and not including his. Art of Gathering by Priya Parker, as someone who is in the business of gathering folks, whether in person or uh, virtually, that um, the principles and recommendations that she has compiled in her book uh, have been phenomenally useful for me and something that are professionally useful and I can apply them on a, on a regular basis in my work. But just in terms of interacting with friends, the, the concepts that she brings together are, are really helpful for understanding you know, how and why we gather, how and why we would interact with one another. And then I'm going to throw in a fourth. Um, I know you asked for three, but you're getting four. That's great. So the fourth is biased. And that's by um, Eberhardt. And so the it's biased, uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think, and do. And this one is something that I'm constantly pushing myself um, to um, ask is in what ways am I bringing a lens to this conversation? Because none of us are objective. We all are looking through a lens of some kind of our own making. And it's through our experiences, through the people that we interact with, through the things that we consume, um, you know, through the, the media that we consume, the books that we read, the, the music that we listen to, the podcasts that we listen to, whatever. All of that shapes how we view the world and how we then view the world and changes how we interpret it. And so Eberhardt's book um, just unpacks all of that. And it just gives you language to be able to um, articulate the things that maybe you knew deep down, but you hadn't really taken the opportunity to think about how it applies in your daily life. And so um, th that book, Biased, uh, I, th I think everybody should spend some time, um, you know, get, get yourself a nice cup of tea and mm -hmm. curl up next to the fire and, and just do some introspection. Just spend some time thinking through um, the ways that uh, we have constructed worldviews around us. Love it. It's 112 degrees here in Texas, and so we won't be sitting by a fire, <laughs> but we might be sitting by a pool to read said book recommendations. <laughs> well, it's pretty warm here in North Carolina right now, but, uh, you know, the, my mental imagery for reading a book is usually curled up yes. next to the fire, even though that fire is usually the sun. <laughs> right. Anything else on any other recommendations or we'll go to where people can find you? The only other thing that I would encourage people to think about is, again, you're a whole person. And so finding ways to diversify your time. And that sounds really weird because everything's always about like focus and productivity. We kind of touched on that already. But, um, you know, for example, uh, Cal Newport has, uh, has several books. He has a wonderful blog and pretty much anything that he writes, I'm a fan of because it is about intentionality with your time. He is a professor, and, and in his work as a professor, he shares strategies for how he can spend you know, three or four hours a day total and be more productive than all of his colleagues that feel like they're spending 70 hours a week in their offices. And that's because he's intentional, and he shares his strategies for intentionality. And so um, I just... I really like that. I think that um, a lot of his, if you were to implement some of what he shares, what you would find is that we all have, because we all have the same amount of time in the day, that's that's the one thing that's universal, um, that we have the ability to then make choices and how we want to structure our time. And so personally, what that looks like is I'm trying to spend more time engaged in physical activity, um, whether that's yoga or resistance training or playing golf. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference on how I feel. And you know, I, I can't, again, just to reiterate that this idea that uh, you know, we're people, we're not machines. And so finding ways to um, not just sit in front of a computer screen all the time is probably good for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Greg. Okay, where can people find you on the socials? What are your preferred platforms? And I'll put all those links in the episode description. 
Yeah, so the most professional aspect is going to be LinkedIn. I, I share there uh, sporadically, not, not daily or anything like that. Um, but uh, I, I do share some professional stuff on LinkedIn. You're welcome to find me on Twitter, Greg Garner 87 I was big into Twitter a few years ago, especially when I was more directly in the education space. And uh, as of late, I would say a combination of world events uh, mixed with just changing in, in changes in my career that I'm less active on Twitter. And when I am, it's usually like golf or politics. So, you know, fair warning, that you know what you're getting into. I have an Instagram account for those of you that are going to go through and, and you know, scroll through it and find Instagram. But uh, fair warning, that's almost exclusively golf, golf related and golf. Uh, entering a lot of <laughs> giveaways. You may have some golf followers yeah. after this. So you could have your own whole <laughs> golf channel or whatnot. Um, Greg, thank you so much. It's always such a delight to connect and you always make me think in new ways. And I know that there are many nuggets and clips that are going to come from this that I'll continue to think on. And so thank you so much for just sharing and continuing to push thinking of those around you and yourself, um, never settling for, you know, one way of thought. And so I uh, look forward to hearing about where things land with your dissertation. You can do it. You're almost there. And um, we look forward to just kind of following along on that. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks for having me, Tracy. And it's it's just been such a privilege to learn alongside you uh, through through these years. So um, I, I said it before, and I'll say it again that you know I'm I'm always your fan. I'm always in your corner. And if there's anything that I can do to to help out, I'm here for it. Thanks so much for listening to the Building Thinkers podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And please leave a podcast rating and review. That helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms. You can find out more about my instructional design work at www.buildingthinkers.com. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll see you all in the next episode. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.